Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an editor for Horde Steryman Magazine, and I would like to welcome you to our monthly webinar series. Um, today, our presentation is titled, An Update on Cooling and Ventilation for Dairy Cows, and our presenter is Dr. Nigel Cook, a professor at the University of Wisconsin School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, Dr. Cook works extensively in the areas of dairy barn design and cow comfort, and we really look forward to learning more from him as we focus today on ventilation and heat abatement. The webinar is sponsored by Tunnel Plus, and we greatly support or greatly appreciate their support of today's webinar. My co-host for the day is Mike Hutchins, a professor emeritus from the University of Illinois, and our other team members include our webinar producer, Jim Baltz, and our Horde Zeriman online media manager, Patty Hurchin. If you are listening to the webinar live, you have the opportunity to print out a PDF of the presentation slides. You can find that in the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel. And also, if you have any questions that arise as Dr. Cook is presenting today, please type those into the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel, and we will address those questions after the presentation. At this time, Mike, would you please further introduce Dr. Cook, and then we can go on with the presentation. Well, thank you very much, Abby, and it's my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Nigel Cook, a professor in the Food Animal Production Medicine section of the University of Wisconsin in Madison in the School of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, Nigel grew up in uh, England, and as you'll hear in his voice, pretty distinctive, and uh, received his veterinary degree in 1992, then served or worked four years in the field in southern uh, England before moving to the Royal Veterinary College, where he spent three years as lecturer and head of the large animal ambulatory clinic. Then in 1999, he saw the light. I'm not sure he did, but anyway, he came to Wisconsin, and there he does a lot of extensive teaching of veterinary students, performing research, and developing outreach programs. And as uh, Abby already has said, he uh, works a lot in building designs along with lameness and dairy cattle. And one of the neat things he's done is develop the, what they call the Dairyland Initiative, and that is supported by a number of companies there, which uh, creates all kinds of good data for, for welfare-friendly cattle housing. He's currently the chair of the Department of Animal of Medical Sciences, past president of AABP, that's American Association of Bovine Practitioners, and is awarded the Wisconsin Veterinary Medical Association's Veterinarian of the Year Award. So, Nigel, we are so pleased to have you online here today, and we'll turn the program over to you. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be here with the Hordes webinar team uh, for one more time. So when you get invited back, I always think it suggests that you didn't screw up too much the first time. So I'll try not to do that again as I give you an update on what we've been doing uh, in relation to cooling and ventilation for adult cows. Uh, it's uh, It's got complicated over the last few years. And that's one of the reasons we got involved is because we were having so many questions related to how do we ventilate these barns? And there are so many different options related to natural ventilation, uh, tunnel and cross ventilation, and these hybrid systems, which use elements of both natural and mechanical uh, systems to ventilate these barns. And uh, the, you know, the, there's been a big move as you look at uh, newer facilities to, to use these uh, mechanical systems laid out in either tunnel or cross ventilation systems uh, which you know, tend to change the direction of flow of air. Uh, you know, in a tunnel system, that airflow is moving in the direction of the feed lane. In a cross ventilation system, it's moving perpendicular to the feed lane. So that's kind of how we define these terms. And so we wanted to get uh, really more involved in understanding these systems and uh, what their impact uh, was on the, the dairy cows, because um, the dairy cows changed over these last few decades. Uh, when you compare the heat output, British thermal units per hour here, uh, of a 40 pound uh, milk per cow per day cow versus a 120 pound milk per cow per day cow, uh, you can see we've doubled the heat output. So those older barns that used to work quite well uh, with uh, those lower producing cows tend not to work as well uh, with our high producing cows because those cows are generating more heat and that means that they're more sensitive to heat stress. And when we use these uh, temperature humidity index uh, levels, that's moved uh, from around 75, 72 to around 68 now as our, our trigger point for deciding when a cow uh, is impacted by heat stress. And we've got lots of data on the physiological consequences of heat stress impacting immune function and fertility. 
uh, and uh, the GI tract and so on. But my main focus has been more on the behavioral consequences of heat stress because we think this is at least as important or perhaps even more important because the data shows that as temperature increases uh, over the temperature ranges that we typically see in the upper Midwest, uh, we lose about three hours a day of resting time and we think that's a pretty big deal for our busy dairy cows. Not only that, but that loss in line time comes with uh, a really frustrating behavior that drives all dairy producers nuts. You big this, build this big, beautiful barn, and in the summer, the cows decide to live in half of it. Uh, and you can see here a, you know, a beautiful, naturally ventilated facility, lots of fans, open sidewalls, and the cows are all bunched up here uh, using half of it. And you can see the same thing going on here. Well, this is due to heat and flies. This is, uh, uh, a, remember, that our cows are grazing animals. They seek shade at pasture when they're hot. They try to do the same thing in buildings. They generally move away from the, the bright areas and they go somewhere dark, which usually means that they end up in the middle of the barn. They move away from the side and end walls. And that can be worse in a north-south oriented barn in the US because of that sun streaming into the west side of the barn in the afternoon. They also will seek faster moving air. And so if the wind is hitting one end of the barn, they may go there and avoid the dead air spots. So uh, producers have you know, tried to solve these issues over the years, closing end wall doors, spraying for flies, uh, using a, a shade cloth, or just simply closing the curtains on the bright side of the barn. But at the essence of at the center of this is really trying to improve air exchange and enhance cooling. This is an example uh, of a farm that we went to this summer doing heat stress audits. And the cows weren't locking up in the middle of the pen here. You can see them all locked down here. They're locked up in the start of the pen. They're all avoiding this area. And we measured much lower air speeds here because there was a big mound of earth uh, being used for the next barn extension uh, being stored there, but it was blocking airflow into this part of the barn and the cows were showing you that with how they behave. So here's a, a poll question uh, for you. In your experience, which is the most common cause of bunching as you visit farms and deal with this issue? Is it heat stress or is it perhaps something else like flies? Well, the polling is now open, so let's go ahead and vote. There are two choices. So there's a 50-50 here. Abby, you're, here's your chance. So we'll see how, how uh, fortunate you are here. If there is a right answer, which one are you going to pick? I know which I'm going to pick. Right, it feels kind of like a, just a guess here because I think <laughs> I think they're both equally um, at fault. But I will pick heat stress. Mike, what is your guess? Yeah, I'm gonna take heat stress also as far as that goes with okay. it at this point. And we've Looks got like uh, seventy five percent of the votes in, Abby. So let's go, Jim. Let's go ahead and close it, and we'll show it uh, to Nigel. And what do you, what do you think of the results, Nigel? Seventy nine percent heat stress. So, um, yeah, I, I think I'm in uh, in agreement with uh, most of the situations that I'll uh, I'll be visiting and trying to troubleshoot. Certainly flies do seem to be uh, a, a situation, a case on a case by case basis. It will occur on some farms, but most of the situations we go to would say uh, heat stress is the bigger concern. So oh, thanks for that reaffirming uh, our thoughts. Let's move on. Why is that the case? So let's deal with these cows as they uh, lie down during a lying bout. They accumulate heat. So a resting cow is getting hotter at the rate of about one degree Fahrenheit per hour. And then when they stand in those same free stalls, they cool at about half that rate. So a standing cow will cool at about half a degree Fahrenheit uh, per hour. If they stand up in an area where they struggle to lose and dissipate heat, such as a holding area pen, the problem is, and you see this huge variation, the problem is they may not lose heat. They may even accumulate heat uh, in, that, uh, in that scenario, suggesting that the holding area is an important area as well, although we're not focused on that today. So cows cool when they stand, they accumulate heat when they lie down. Remember that. Traditionally, we're very much focused on the use of water, and water soaking can have a lot of beneficial effects uh, for the dairy cow uh, when they're heat stressed, uh, particularly in very hot climates. They will impact body temperature, feed intake, and milk production. But when we look at lying times, the results are pretty equivocal. There's a little bit of a decrease, or sorry, an increase here, decrease here. Overall, we don't see a huge improvement in lying time if we just rely on water soaking. 
Um, and uh, as we've uh, kind of learned, the, uh, uh, the U.S. is getting a little warmer each, uh, each year, it seems. So how much longer can we just continue to rely on these uh, water soaking systems? In many cases, not making sure that the water is actually landing on the cows. And so I see the trend with these types of feedline soakers is activating them at slightly higher temperatures, uh, 70 to 75 at the low range, 82, 85 at the high range, shortening the shower time you know, to about half a minute or so. And then the interval between these showers, usually around 12 to 15 minutes at low, and then six to 10 minutes at high. We've got to be careful with the use of water, but water isn't going to solve our line time problem. So, so what is? Well, I, I think that's why we're talking here about ventilation. I think ventilating not only the barn, but the space that the cow occupies, uh, occupies the pen microenvironment and the stall microenvironment that that cow lives in. Whatever we do, to ventilate this uh, barn, it has to impact the cow. And that's really been our focus. And that's where we see uh, our critical priorities here. Target airspeed in the resting microenvironment is our number one. Number two is sufficient air exchange because you know simply putting fans over the cows doesn't solve the heat stress problem if you don't exhaust that uh, heat, those noxious gases and the moisture from the barn, it will continue to cause problems. Making sure that these systems work as well across all seasons is a, uh, our third priority. And lastly, making sure that whatever we do as uh, dairy producers, uh, what we're doing is cost effective. So it makes sense economically. So to answer the, the question of, of what kind of airspeed should we be providing cows, we set up a study, uh, not this uh, summer, but the last summer, right in the midst of the pandemic at our UW Arlington facility and all the workers there did a terrific job of helping us with this project. This is Kim Reicher's PhD uh, study and part of a USDA care grant uh, with my colleague uh, John, uh, Jennifer Van Os and uh, postdoc uh, Mario Mandaka. So what we did, uh, we very kindly had some uh, uh, variable frequency drive uh, panel fans donated to us from Munters, uh, hand uh, mounted these fans over uh, small pens of 16 stalls. Those are the rows of eight in the head-to-head -head, uh, layout. We had two test pens. This is one. There's another one down here with a pen in between. Uh, and we were able to supply uh, different treatments, different fan speed treatments. So a control where they were switched off, a low and a high speed treatment, and monitor the cows over the course of a week and rotate uh, groups of cows through. So we had data from a total of 128 cows that experienced each of these three fan speed treatments. And this is a naturally ventilated barn. So we worked with the fan manufacturer to make sure that we had uh, good air distribution over this uh, lying area here. You can see a test pen here uh, with the fans located in the corner. And these were the air speeds that we got. So in our low speed treatment, our aim was to make sure we had at least 200 feet per minute in all of the stalls. And you can see here, we achieved that goal just about measuring with a hot wire anemometer here at resting height. This is measured at one and a half feet, 0.5 meters above the stall surface. In the high speed treatment at 100% of uh, airspeed, uh, we were shooting to try to get above 400 feet per minute in all of the stalls. This one, we had a low reading probably because the air was hitting this curb and bouncing over the top of our, the device we were using to measure the airspeed. So I think we achieved our goal overall. So low, low airspeed treatment around 336 feet per minute or 1.7 meters a second. Our high speed treatment, an average of 475 feet per minute, 2.4 meters per second. And then basically our control with no fans operating, which was basically resting air. Um, so what did we find? Well. Um, we actually succeeded in keeping cows lying down. So you can see as the THI increases, uh, our control cows lost lying time as we predicted. But when we applied these fan treatments at the 60% or 100% of power, we improved lying time uh, fairly considerably of the order of an hour or so. So this was a significant improvement. And the slope of these lines, fascinating, they're actually you know, sloping slightly upwards here uh, as temperature increases. So that was fantastic. We achieved our goal of keeping cows lying down uh, under higher uh, ambient temperatures with these fan treatments. We uh, predictably uh, did the same with uh, vaginal temperature using these little star oddies on blank cedars. 
as the temperature increases, the control body temperatures increased. When we supplied fan uh, movement and air movement over the stalls, we managed to moderate that uh, uh, temperature increase. So that was fantastic. And then from the perspective of the person paying for the fans, uh, this is also good news that those fan treatments uh, yielded uh, more milk of the order of two to three pounds of milk uh, over these temperature ranges. So that was really uh, good news as well. What was fascinating, and this, these were data that uh, our friends at Munters helped uh, put together for us, you expect to pay more for electricity as you move from a 60% uh, fan speed to 100%. But I was amazed at how much more. This is more than double. Uh, the cost uh, when you go to that 100% uh, percent of speed versus the 60%. And while we saw some small incremental improvements of running fans at that higher speed, we got most of the benefits at that 60% level. And so we have to do that economic analysis of deciding whether that extra airspeed is actually worth it. And it may well be the case that that is true at higher temperatures, so much hotter climates. But in more moderate climates, uh, I would be making the case that these uh, variable frequency drive units that we can attach to these fans, even though they may be sort of 500 bucks per fan, uh, they can uh, pay for themselves in a fairly short period of time. So we define this minimum cooling airspeed, uh, trying to get at least 200 uh, feet per minute, two and a quarter of a mile an hour or one meter per second at that resting height, measured one and a half feet above the ground, of, above the stall or the resting surface. And there are some uh, smaller uh, returns going to 400 or 500 feet per minute or five miles an hour at that height, uh, two to two and a half meters per second. But you'd have to question the economics of uh, trying to uh, supply that. And maybe it is worth it for the hottest climates, but maybe not for the more temperate ones. And so practically how we use this information tells us uh, how to space fans. So these are sort of typical uh, panel fan spacings, and we've uh, often put these uh, above the, the stall resting area, which is where we should be putting it, um, but we haven't put them close enough together. And you can see the air distribution coming from this fan. We want to layer that air, and you can see this big space underneath the fan that isn't getting that air jet, and so we have to overlap those air jets, typically spacing fans at uh, sort of seven to nine meters, 24 to 30 feet uh, apart, and we were used to be putting those fans a little further apart than that, turning most of the fans on at around 68 Fahrenheit or 20 degrees centigrade. So here's an example of one of those sort of newer recommendation barns. Every row of stalls gets a fan, so even the outside row of stalls has a fan uh, uh, row above them. And because these roof posts are 12 foot centers, these uh, fans are every 24 feet, uh, and they are directed aggressively down to the cow below the adjacent fan. So we basically layer that fast moving air over the resting uh, space. We can use far, uh, bigger fans or double fans as we did in our study. We used two of these fans and managed to move that air over around 40 feet uh, to supply that air speed. Or we could use these larger fans. These are 72 inch louvered fans that can be spaced now at around 40 to 60 feet or 12 to 18 meters. Uh, giving uh, a, a choice with uh, fewer mounting costs, perhaps less wiring costs, uh, and perhaps a little different barn aesthetic uh, compared to those fans on every other post. We are uh, working with uh, the HVLS fan companies. Um, there is at least one company addressing the biggest issue with these fans is this uh, word, these two words here, low speed. Uh, so they're not originally designed to provide the kind of cooling air speeds that we want. But there is, again, so at least one manufacturer adapting the, this technology to start to get the air speeds uh, that we're looking for. In a uh, mechanical system like a cross vent, uh, we, we can get the air speed that we need without using fans. Uh, we can use the negative pressure system uh, and redirect air using baffles. And you see here a baffle system here. And obviously, once you purchase this baffle, you don't have to pay electricity to run it. Uh, and so that can be uh, cheaper to run uh, than using fans to supply that nice fast moving air through the resting area. So airspeed mapping is a critical part of our troubleshooting. And here's Dr. Mario Mandaka with the device he uh, helped develop and the approach that he, he put together for us. 
uh, using this little device to measure standing uh, and uh, uh, lying um, uh, air speeds, uh, typically moving this device around the barn, measuring for around a minute or so in each place. And you can kind of see uh, by these red X's about how we would go about doing that in a tunnel barn, cross-ventilated barn. And we're going to be running some on-farm workshops uh, next summer as part of this USDA care grant to follow up on uh, the uh, heat stress audits that we did this summer. So we're going to be doing that next summer into the, the following year. So we're going to have fun doing that. We've also got what, what I call practical design recommendations. Um, this is the kind of stuff vets come up with versus engineers. A lot of the engineers will focus on air exchange per unit body weight, but a lot of the maths behind that were developed in the 1950s when cows were a little different. So we have kind of a threshold here for the summer of around 1500 CFM or two and a half thousand meters cubed per hour per adult cow. I prefer to use things like air changes an hour, so four to eight in the winter, 40 to 60 in the summer. Uh, Cross-sectional airspeed's pretty useless in most barns unless you have a baffle system, and then you're measuring that airspeed below the baffle, where we're shooting for about four to 500 feet per minute, two to two and a half meters per second. And then it's always important to measure inlet speed and making sure that incoming air is mixing adequately with the air already in the barn, so making sure that's coming in at around 500 to 800 feet per minute, two and a half to four meters per second. So in the industry, uh, what we've seen over the last few years is the industry sort of coalesce in the US around these different approaches to ventilating cow barns. There isn't one uh, approach that everybody uses. Natural ventilation still hanging around, positive pressure hybrid systems, tunnel hybrid systems, pure tunnels, and then cross vents with either fans or baffles over the stalls. And these are our six main uh, choices. And uh, we've got a poll question to ask you, what are you seeing? Uh, here we're focused on larger farms, free stall housed uh, uh, cows predominantly. So what are you seeing in the industry as the most common mechanical ventilation approach? So we're leaving off the natural ventilation off this list. You've got five choices here, positive pressure hybrids, tunnel hybrids, tunnel ventilation, uh, cross baffles and cross fans. So what's what's the most common uh, within those new facilities that you're seeing? Well, Abby, you're going to earn your uh, your points on this one here. This is a really a tough one at this point. Uh, he took off the one I was going to stay with, and that's natural vent because a lot of <laughs> a lot of a lot of buildings in Illinois they just aren't they just aren't able to do well unless they're building a brand new barn. But he does say new facilities, so new facilities, new we facilities. Can build it. We can yeah. build them. We can build it in. So, Abby, here, here's your choice now. We, uh, we're getting votes coming in. That's about 50%. What do you, where are you going to be? Yeah, I'll be curious to see what people are seeing out in the industry. I think for me, the most recent new dairy barns I've been in have been cross vent with baffles. I feel like that's been, a, you know, of the, of the places I've been, that's been a common, yeah. common way to go with ventilation. Well, we'll see what Dr. Cook says. That 200, if it was 2,000, I think I'd know which way I'd vote. It was 2,000 <laughs> or 600 or 1,000 as far as that sure. goes. And I'm kind of intrigued with that positive pressure thing because we, I think we see that in calf housing. So uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll just vote for, for positive, the, the first choice one, positive pressure hybrid ventilation because I don't know anything about it. So now I just go, let's, let's put, Jim, let's post it that we're in here with uh, about uh, two thirds of the vote, and uh, wow, wait, it kind of looks like a, a race in Arizona for for president. Uh, what do you Man, think? Look, I look at that. So I think we've just got the cross vent with fans uh, taking the uh, the poll at thirty six percent. But I think the distribution you're seeing very representative that there's there's multiple solutions. Mike, I put in the two hundred cows because a lot of our new barns have robots, and uh, we see a lot of robot. Uh, uh, milking systems being built with uh, mechanical ventilation systems. So that that was why I went with the 200 because that's the average size of our our robots in uh, in the U.S. right now. So neat, very interesting. And and I, I will tell you that you can build all of those to operate very effectively, very well uh, operating systems. We've again working with you know great companies. They've really stepped their game up these last few years. But equally you can design any one of these to fail miserably. So uh, it really gets back to you know, working with people that knowing what they're doing and uh, making good choices. But there are better choices that fit certain climatic, uh, social and economic circumstances. I'm gonna try to go through that uh, a little bit here. So again, 
your design choice will be a function of, you know, a lot of different uh, factors will come into here related to climate, layout, economics. Uh, farmers' tolerance for cleaning and maintaining fans has to come into play here. A lot of these systems use a lot of fans, uh, some social influences, and obviously the performance of these systems. So um, I still think, and I'll agree with Mike, that uh, natural ventilation is still a good option for many uh, situations. It uh, can be economically viable, uh, very strong uh, uh, reasons for using that in certain circumstances and under uh, quite a varied climate. They don't work so well when it gets really hot and humid. That is the big breakdown. It's where that sort of bunching behavior we see a lot of. You know, single barns, yeah, where we've got adequate spacing between barns, perhaps, where we're able to do that. Uh, that still makes uh, sense. Narrower barns, so up to six rows of stalls, but really no more than that if we're going to get good natural ventilation. Where we've got ideal topography, where you've got good access to uh, prevailing winds and so on, where we can orient the barn uh, generally east to west in the in the U.S., so we can capture that those winds from the south and the southwest, particularly in the summer. Uh, obviously, if you're in a, a region where uh, electricity cost is high, so if you go to Europe, you know two and a half times the energy cost uh, compared to the U.S., you're going to make some different decisions because of the cost of electricity. And in certain milk markets, uh, if you've, you're in a milk market where you have to let your cows outside, it precludes the use of some of these more intensive mechanical systems. Well, this is what I call the, the dungeon barn solution, you know, positive pressure tubes. We talked about it with the calves at length. Uh, we can apply these systems into adult cow barns. They work over relatively short distances. Um, they bring fresh air in from the outside and look at this barn. This is a European barn where all the side walls are closed up and just the value of bringing some fresh air in from the outside cannot be understated. And you see a system here, a uh, German system. Uh, so uh, interesting uh, use of that technology. Good for variable climates. Uh, again, not too hot and humid as it gets hotter. They, they, they're not good enough for that. Smaller barns, just because we're limited by the types of fan we have available. So a pen size is usually around 100 cows or so. Uh, very closed up barns with high, uh, you know, closed in sidewalls where fresh air delivery is a priority. But these are very efficient systems. They use very little electricity and obviously there's adaptability uh, in uh, mixed grazing herds. So uh, just a really a, a, more, a hybrid of that is to you know, move the fans from over the stalls uh, and stick them on the sidewall. And instead of exhausting air out of the barn, you push air into it. This is uh, Gordy jo Jones's uh, positive pressure hybrid system, provides a lot of flexibility uh, between the seasons. Um, good for variable climates, uh, but really kind of dedicated to one kind of fixed layout with a center feed lane. And for me, a sort of two row head-to-head uh, -head pen where we're directing that air over the head-to-head -head, uh, platform. Um, again, efficient because it uh, doesn't use an awful lot of electricity, but um, there's a lot of fans in these things. So uh, you have to uh, factor that into play, but very adaptable, uh, good as a hybrid. Uh, it can allow cows to come and go in and out of the barn when you're using any of these positive pressure hybrid systems. Moving on to the tunnel, this is a dedicated tunnel. So now we have polycarb sidewalls rather than curtains. We have fans over the stalls as we would in our naturally ventilated barns, but you see here the exhaust fans at the end of the barn moving that air uh, in through a tunnel and uh, makes a lot of sense in uh, hot climates. We get very efficient exhaust of air. This is actually a barn in Australia, uh, wonderful high producing uh, herd, very well managed, very successful uh, barn. So when it's uh, more hot, uh, when in the hotter climates, hot year, all year round, um, uh, get a little queasy when we start to get uh, too long these barns. I, I, you know, to put a 500 foot limit there, there's plenty of tunnels that are a thousand feet long, but I think you have to think about ways of bringing fresh air in halfway along to, to help with that. I think you're kind of limited in terms of the barn layout again to a, a an eight row barn. You can successfully tunnel. Um, generally, uh, you're going to be using some uh, more fans, higher electrical costs, and the barns are generally dedicated to those where the cows are housed all year round. So it's hard to develop this system and then have cows go in and outside of the barn. 
Uh, this is uh, another tunnel, but it's now a hybrid system. So now we have the exhaust fans, fans over the uh, stalls, but we've also got curtains on the side wall uh, and uh, cupola fans. So we've got chimney fans up here that help draw the air out through the, the roof. And so in the summer, we can go full tunnel. Uh, in the winter, we can use the sidewall inlets and use the cupola fans to help draw that air out of the ridge, what we call a hybrid system. Because we have both fans and curtains, there are higher costs to these systems and probably not worth those higher costs in varied climates, uh, sorry, in uh, hot climates that are hot all year round. But perhaps that increased flexibility is more worthwhile in varied climates when we have colder winters and hotter summers. And I think I've mainly said that same kind of rules apply related to a tunnel hybrid as a tunnel, kind of limited to the design. And that was an eight row, three feed lane barn that I just showed you a picture of. Um, more electrical costs, higher setup costs, but quite a bit of flexibility uh, within that system. So you can have cows going outside uh, if pasture ac access is required and still maintain that system using that hybrid approach of uh, a sort of natural ventilation approach, even though we're using chimney fans to assist that uh, versus that full tunnel in the summer. Then moving on to the cross vents, we've uh, traditionally used baffles to create that airspeed in the, the resting area uh, when we need it. And one of the disadvantage of those baffles is it kind of blocks the air in the winter uh, at a slower airspeed. So we have to be careful about the use of these baffles. And you can kind of see this retractable baffle that we take up and out of the way when we don't need it uh, in the winter. So we've seen a lot of uh, cross uh, baffles. So that wasn't the winner of our uh, of our review here in the poll, but this is certainly quite common in the industry to see these types of facilities. This is a temperature contour map, um, different barn designs with uh, no baffles uh, and then baffles at different locations and different slopes and so on. But really what I want to show you is the accumulation of heat uh, in this barn. This is just an eight row barn, uh, but you can see that those baffles trap air within the barn. And then by the time you get to the exhaust side, you see higher uh, temperatures. You'll see that in the winter as condensation dripping off the uh, the purlins on the, the roof uh, near the, the fans because of that accumulation and trapping of warm, moist air uh, within the facility, which really gets us to those flexible baffle positions where we can have a curtain baffle rather than a solid tin baffle. So we can uh, take that up and out of the way to cope with variable climates. These are suited to wide body barns this is my personal preference. I would hold these barns to around 10 rows of stalls um, with a baffle system um, where electrical costs are high because these uh, systems can now become very efficient. And in hotter climates, uh, I'll show you some data to show uh, the electrical costs can be comparable, even less than naturally ventilated barns with fans over the stalls. Um, but uh, no real way of allowing cows to go in and out of these barns. They're negative pressure systems, so you've got to be confinement 24-7 to operate these uh, barns. And they can be adapted to the use of evaporative cooling systems with evaporative cooling pads, although the trend in our region is to move away from that technology because they don't work as well in high humidity uh, situations. They need low humidity to operate uh, optimally. So the winner of our poll was actually this, uh, these cross vents without baffles. And we see these now using, uh, again, fans replacing the baffles to move that air uh, over the resting space. Um, and um, with that becomes you know, increased costs. You're not only now paying for fans to exhaust the air out of the barn, but you're paying for fans to move that air over the resting space, as we did in that uh, tunnel and uh, hybrid tunnel situation. So very similar kind of setup. Um, good for variable climates, hot and cold. Uh, good for those wider body barns. So if we're going to push uh, beyond those 10 rows of stalls, again, my preference would be, you know, the cross fan would be where I would be going with that type of facility because we can use those fans over the stalls to help uh, continue to move that air across the barn without it getting trapped uh, between the baffles. And uh, there are producers out there just simply don't like those uh, tin or curtain baffles. And so this is a, a solution for them. Uh, again, uh, uh, pretty competitive on, uh, um, uh, sorry, they can be adapted for evaporative cooling. 
uh, not particularly good for letting the cows out of the barn. That's going to be a challenge and uh, high cost because we're using uh, more fans. So if electrical costs are high, that's uh, a concern with this kind of design. So what we do uh, within our workshops, we'll you know, go through examples of different ways of designing a barn for a certain number of cows. This is a, an exercise built around uh, 800 cows for 200 cow pens, and you can lay it out this way with a center feed lane, or you can lay it out this way in a square a barn with three feed lanes. So different options, different solutions. And uh, part of Marianne Mandaka's work with us was to develop uh, a way of trying to estimate the cost of operating these systems. Ooh, the thunder started here. You can hear that crackle. So he uses a, a six-year average for uh, regional temperatures built into a little spreadsheet that uh, he developed for us, and uh, this is available, and we use this in our uh, workshops for uh, training. So we can calculate the cost of running these different systems, applying that to that 800 cow barn or whatever barn you want to do, and then try to calculate the, the losses uh, from heat stress. This comes back all the way back to St. Pierre's 2003 data, and we have that built into our spreadsheet to calculate the marginal milk loss from heat stress. And so in this region here, uh, I think this is for Green Bay, Wisconsin. We have a uh, uh, loss per cow per year of about $81 per cow per year estimated from milk uh, alone. So if we can design a system that runs for less than $80 per cow uh, in, a dis in this particular region, we think that that can start, we can have a conversation about that being an economically viable approach. These numbers need to be updated. You know, again, they're from 2003, things are changing very dramatically related to climate, and probably uh, these are uh, modest uh, assessments of uh, the losses from heat stress compared to what we're seeing now. So just to give you an example of, uh, of that, for our 800 cow barn in Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, we've got uh, these different, these six different uh, examples of ventilating these barns, and you can see the cost to operate and the cost to install uh, based on some estimates here. And for example, a naturally ventilated barn, as you'd expect, is the lowest operating cost, about $20 per cow, and the lowest installation cost. But come to that cross vent baffle at 56 fans here, fewer fans. Uh, these are exhaust fans, these are fans over the stalls. And while it is a slightly higher operating cost, the installation cost is actually very uh, similar to that naturally ventilated barn. That positive pressure hybrid uh, wins the, the, the um, the operating cost at the lowest operating cost, but has the highest installation cost because it has four times as many fans as you would with a cross vent uh, baffle for this scenario. And then our typical mechanically ventilated barn, whether it's a, a tunnel or cross vent with fans, typically runs at around fifty to sixty dollars per cow per year to run, and these are your estimated installation costs. So fascinating stuff. You can play around with this. Uh, you can work with farmers uh, and teams to you know, generate these estimates and have that conversation about the right choice. Generally, if you compare Madison, Wisconsin with Jacksonville, Florida, uh, in those hot climates where you just run the system all year round and don't stop, uh, the operating costs double. So you can multiply that cost by two uh, as you move to Florida, but it also accentuates those cost savings in those cross vent baffles uh, where you can actually get systems now that are running at lower operating costs than a naturally ventilated barn with fans over the stalls, which is kind of amazing and kind of explains why the, the popularity of, of those barns. So what can be done to reduce costs? Um, that is a, uh, you know, a significant issue for us with these mechanical systems, particularly in uh, parts of the world where electrical costs are high. We have to find competitive solutions. And one of the things is, is ramping, and well, ramping is moving from winter ventilation rates to summer ventilation rates. You can see in air changes an hour here. How do you get from A to B? Do you go in a straight line? Do you go in an exponential uh, line? Or do you go in this stepped manner, which is usually what we do? Uh, and you can play around with those different approaches, um, turning fans on and off. Uh, but one of the main approaches, as I showed you, was that use of variable frequency drives. Running fans at lower speeds than their maximum saves a lot of electricity. So they're very, uh, very, very, um, uh, very useful. And rather than just activating everything with a switch when we feel hot, which is a terrible way to do it, 
or simply just using temperature located in one area of the barn, uh, more sophisticated systems are being developed to operate these systems, getting more data using things like temperature, humidity, potentially airspeed in the future. Uh, and you see uh, a lot of uh, industry effort uh, going into these climate controlled systems using more data. Uh, building these smart control systems. Ultimately, we're not there yet, but we see a, a future where, to, uh, you know, telemetry from the cows uh, are telling us uh, how to operate these ventilation systems optimally. Um, again, there's lots of exciting developments in that area and certainly where the industry is heading. Fan performance is a really a, a discussion to have when you're designing these systems, not only in terms of the airflow rate, you know, this is the, the the output from the fan at a certain static pressure. Remember, in these negative pressure systems, uh, you're, uh, you, you're choosing the fan capacity that under that uh, negative static pressure. Um, but we also look at CFM per watt, so the, the fan efficiency or the ventilation efficiency ratio. How much airflow are you getting per watt of electricity? Uh, an important number uh, in terming, determining the cost of the, running these systems uh, over the course of a year but also how good that fan is, and that's the airflow ratio, the airflow rate at a higher uh, static pressure versus a lower static pressure. Um, and that, um, that airflow ratio can tell you whether a fan will be able to function, for example, in a situation where it's having to exhaust into oncoming air. So these factors all come into play in uh, fan choice, and we can have some independent data uh, coming from the University of Illinois, big shout out to the best lab there, still an independent source of information. Uh, Amduker, uh, Am, uh, sorry, AMCA, <laughs> Amduker, AMCA certification. Um, uh, some certain private uh, fan companies will have their own AMCA testing facilities. Other times you're looking for this AMCA Air Movement and Control Association International uh, certified testing to help us make these decisions. And again, just as an example of how important that choice is, uh, designing a facility for about 1,500 cows at 40 air changes an hour, a tunnel ventilation system, uh, we put these scenarios together using these fans, all from one manufacturer. So this is one manufacturer's fans, a 55-inch all the way to a 72-inch exhaust fan. This is the CFM per watt. This is the operating cost per cow. So you can get a difference of about $20 per cow per year depending on what type of fan you pick. And obviously we're going to use other factors other than CFM per watt in the ultimate decision, mounting requirements, noise level, the airflow ratio, the, the different scenarios. But you've got to have a conversation about these running costs because they can be different between the different choices that we make. And once you install a fan, remember there was a fourfold difference in the number of fans between these different choices. Every fan you install is a fan you have to clean and maintain uh, forever. Uh, you don't get a year off with these, and probably every twi you know, twice a year, these fans should be serviced and maintained, looking at uh, uh, belt pulleys, looking at these you know, highly contaminated louvers, getting things cleaned off, because you'll lose 24% or more of the uh, ability of that fan, the efficiency of that fan just drops uh, like a stone. So you can design a great system, but if you don't maintain it, it isn't going to work for you. So that's the discussion that, you know, we've really had with the, the industry over the last few years, you know, arriving at these different approaches. Dairy is so different compared to swine and poultry. We're going to have these different solutions and they uh, will uh, suit different circumstances, different choices that producers have to make in different regions. And hopefully I've given you a few pointers as to, you know, what, uh, uh, what solution would be best in, in certain situations. And so there's a summary table there that just really goes through all the uh, discussion that we've just had. Again, there's a wide variety of options uh, in dairy for keeping cows cool in the summer and exhausting that contaminated air in the winter. Uh, but they have to be designed well. They have to be appropriate to the climate that we're uh, dealing with. They have to be economically viable, uh, otherwise we're gonna go broke, and they have to be effective all year round. And that's simple if it's just hot all year round, like Florida, you just turn the system on, let it run. But in the upper Midwest, where we have uh, uh, cold, uh, cold winters and hot summers, 
um, challenging to get these systems to work as well across all those different seasons. And really just leave you with the, the take home that fan choice is really important uh, in these solutions. And there's a lot of overlap in the cost of operation between these different approaches, uh, dependent on the type of fan that you choose. Well, um, Mike, I can't do the things that I do without the uh, sponsors, in particular our premier sponsor, Saputo. They've been uh, incredibly helpful, as have all of our sponsors over the years. And our Dairyland Initiative website, I'll give you the link there, uh, will take you to, uh, uh, to that. And uh, very happy to answer the questions that have come in. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Cook, very much for this presentation. Um, cows breathe 24 hours a day, every day, so there's no doubt that a well-designed ventilation system is essential to the lives of dairy cows and the farmers that are taking care of them. So thank you so much for sharing this information. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Dr. Cook. Um, not only is he a great asset to the dairy industry, but he was recently recognized by his peers at the American Association of Bovine Practitioners with an award of excellence. So congratulations on that award. I would also oh, you're welcome. Um, I would also like to thank Tunnel Plus for serving as the sponsor for this webinar. Again, we greatly appreciate their support of the program. And if you want to learn more about them, you can certainly look them up online, or if you click on the handouts um, section of the GoToWebinar control panel and print out one of those handouts, there is an informational sheet from Tunnel Plus in there. So um, please look into them if you want to learn more. Um, if you can click ahead a slide, Dr. Cook. Yep. And one more. There you go. Um, back. So if you enjoyed today's presentation, we hope that you'll make plans to meet us again here on our monthly webinars. And our next presentation will take place on November 8th. And on that day, we will have a Forage and Feed Outlook presentation. Our speakers for that day will be Mike Hutchins from the University of Illinois and Mike Rankin, our hay and forage grower managing editor for that magazine. And that presentation will be sponsored by Cargill. And then in December, we will have a presentation by Sarah Morrison from the Minor Institute focusing on caring for calves in cold weather and particularly cold climate. So um, Agroplastics is our sponsor for that webinar. So, Again, please mark your calendar if either or both of these topics are interesting to you and make plans to join us for that presentation. Now, we did have a question or two that came in prior to the webinar, so we will answer those now. And then we had a good group that came in during the presentation. So if anyone else would like to add to that list, please um, type your questions in now. And Mike, if you would go through these, and then Nigel, we look forward to hearing your responses. Well, very good. Uh, we're off and running here, and we do have a bunch of questions. Here's our first one, and we encourage you to send them in. Uh, this is the first time I've seen this one. Uh, a very large herd in, obviously, uh, Dubai, uh, 15,000 cows, which very high temperature humidity, and they are using the uh, corral cooler, uh, a misting fan system, but was told cooling ponds would work better. Nigel, what's your thoughts about <laughs> Yeah, trying to trying to work out uh, my experience of uh, Wisconsin versus Dubai. Yeah, uh, it uh, that's a, this is going to be a tough one. So you've got the Kral Cool uh, system, which is basically adding water to the air to help cool the air, and that works like an evaporative cooling pad works in lower humidity environments. So uh, don't know what the humidity levels are in Dubai, but if you're kind of hot, dry climate. Uh, that would be a great approach. Cooling ponds for me, uh, that sounds like an animal welfare problem. And uh, I think we really, as an industry, uh, I think we've got to move away from that kind of approach. If uh, uh, We've got to find better solutions than putting cows into a pond. So I'm going to stay with those corral cool with uh, uh, the uh, misting fan system. Yeah, let's uh, go. To, uh, let's click to the next one. We have another question. I was, been in, I was there once and... Uh, Trust me, when you're walking the herd, you do want to stand underneath those coolers. No question about that. Uh, it was really unbelievable. 140 degrees that day there, and we'll yep. leave it at that. Okay, we do have questions that came in here. Here's uh, the first one. Uh, what is the temperature difference between uh, needed between an inside of a building and the outside for a natural ventilation uh, system to work properly? Should there be a differential in temperature? Um. Yeah, good question. So for natural ventilation, um, you know, you're working on uh, the what's called the stack effect or 
um, the heating effect of the animals within the barn to warm that air so that it exits through the ridge. Uh, I don't have in my head you know, data on what that you know, temper di differential should be. Uh, in mechanical systems, we work on a sort of two to four degree Fahrenheit uh, difference between the inlet and outlet. Um, but there obviously you know, should be a temperature differential. Uh, the warmer that air is coming in, the more likely it is you know, to, to sort of follow straight up through, uh, hug the, the, the roof lining and uh, head towards the ridge without mixing adequately with the, the animal space. But um, I don't have the experience of, of knowing what that temperature differential should be, Mike. Okay. Moving on to our second question. It's kind of a long one, so hang on to your hat here. When ventilating Thanks. large volume buildings, it's essential to always target the ventilation across uh, ventilation according to achieving a particular number of air exchanges per hour. That's the question. Now, for example, if, if the ridge of the building is really high, then the volume in the building is going to be even higher, even though the animals live on the ground. Or mm -hmm. should we be looking at the supply volume of per animal, uh, air per animal? Did I confuse you totally? No, I think that really gets back to the argument of, you know, what numbers should we be using? Should we focus on the air exchange per animal? Should we focus on air changes an hour? And we kind of fall into that. You should look at all those numbers. Um, but all of those numbers rely on the fact that the air moves and mixes predictably and evenly through the, the, uh, the, the, the building space. And that simply isn't true. We've, we've shown that isn't true. There are these micro environments uh, within the barn where air gets trapped, uh, particularly in the cow space where the cows live. And so all those numbers are really just relying on the fact that that air is moving uh, evenly through the barn. And, and that's not true. So yes, we, we look at those numbers. And I again, I'll lean more towards air changes an hour versus air per animal. But uh, you you overstock those barns. You better look at air per animal as well. And we have a tendency to to, to do that. Uh, so these numbers are relatively crude. And again, uh, you know, getting in there and measuring what's happening where the cows are living in terms of the airflow that they're receiving and so on, critically important. Okay, another interesting question. How do you calculate the air supply by natural ventilation? Is this done by uh, smoking the building and see how long it takes to clear to calculate air exchanges per hour? Yeah, I'd, I'd love that to be true. Uh, but if you do that, if you, uh, if you put a smoke uh, device into a barn, it, uh, the, the smoke will hang around a lot longer than the actual true ventilation rate. So that isn't a very good way of monitoring that air changes an hour. So um, because the again the air doesn't move predictably, it, it, uh, uh, it sticks in some areas, it uh, moves in others. Um, so not particularly good uh, as a prediction. It's actually incredibly hard. Uh, and again, you'd have to be a much better engineer than I am to calculate air exchange rates at uh, uh, for natural ventilation. They rely on a, a knowledge of uh, the uh, the inlet area, they rely on a knowledge of the average air speeds that that inlet are, is receiving. So you can do it, um, but it's not a very practical um, way of troubleshooting those barns. And so we've uh, we certainly uh, attempted those calculations in the past, but very, very dependent on wind direction and wind speed. Okay, here's come kind of a couple of unique situations, Nigel. First of all, uh, one of your colleagues would ask about robot barns. Should we positively ventilate the robot room so the cows are attracted to the robot because it's cool in there and maybe keep uh, a bit of the dirt out of them as well? Yeah, I, I love that idea. Um, I, I am a proponent of getting good airflow and making the area around the robot attractive. Um, these are areas that are, you know, there's a lot of competition around the robot. Uh, getting good airflow into those uh, areas is is important, and it's tricky. You know, we stick robot rooms on the side of the barn where it blocks uh, inlets and uh, uh, airflow. We stick them in the middle of the barn, uh, where again they become shielded from the air movement around the barn. So, actually, yeah, piping you know, fresh air into a robot room. Why not? Sounds like a great idea to me. And maybe this next one ties right into it. And he says, it's a tricky question. Any new work on cooling stall beds? Uh, 
stanchion uh, stall beds, stanchion barns, I guess you'd say. Yeah, Mike, I lost two summers of my life uh, with uh, Dr. Mondaka trying to develop a cooling uh, bed. And uh, I won't waste a, a third summer uh, trying to get that. So what we found was that they, are, they have the potential to work. What you can do is pipe uh, well water into that lying surface and it'll take about a degree, half a degree uh, centigrade out of, the, uh, out of the cow's body temperature when it's operating. But then once you've installed it, the cows will decide to remodel that facility almost as soon as you uh, uh, let them uh, lie on those facilities and uh, they are a beast to maintain. So practically, um, you know, uh, scientifically, it, it uh, has the potential to work and uh, can be a solution in a hot uh, humid environment, but practically, man, it's it's tough to get, keep those things working in real life. And here's your third one to, to sink your teeth into. What about a compost barn? What would be the appropriate combinations in a compost barn, especially in the summer and winter when you've got the compost generating heat and you're generating, you're working them twice a day? Yeah, I mean, we see a lot of the compost barns um, really stay with natural ventilation. Uh, and again, that, that source of heat in the winter you know, helps drive that, uh, um, that thermal buoyancy and the movement of air through the ridge. So that, that's you know, potentially a good thing for the winter. But that heat generation also occurs in the summer as well. And that can be a you know, potential problem. Biggest challenge I see with those facilities is uh, you know, getting our target air speeds. Uh, and uh, just you know, panel fans hanging over... Uh, a, a bedded pack, you have to put them so high be to avoid all the equipment that you're using to stir the bedding and remove the bedding and so on. Hard to get the distribution of air that we want. Um, so although, you know, we have some you know, debate with the folks that build these HVLS fans, um, HVLS fans are actually a nice solution to a bedded pack system where you don't have all the, you know, the debris of stall divider loops and things, you know, creating obstructions to airflow. That uh, air from an HVLS fan can be driven down onto the bedded pack and diffuse outwards, uh, and they can be a nice, tidy solution. Uh, and again, uh, certainly I'm aware of at least one manufacturer where we're getting higher air speeds from their designs. They're using sort of the designs from propellers and things to you know, create that faster moving air. So um, that can be a, a definite solution for those compost bonds. But most of the ones we see are still naturally ventilated. Kind of a related topic in the sense of these tunnel ventilated barns. If cows are standing up, do they really bugger up the airflow uh, to cows that are lying down? I mean, is that a problem or don't worry about it? Yeah, cow, I, mean, I like to say cows are baffles. Um, so when, when they're standing, they're blocking the airflow to uh, the cow downwind. So when you're looking at those different options of, you know, bigger fans further apart or smaller fans closer together, you can more predictably deliver and layer uh, air to more cows as you put them closer together. Because, you know, as, as you rightly said, a, a cow standing up will divert air around them and shield the cow lying down next to it. Um, so that is, you know, a factor that comes into play when you think of, uh, uh, of those different approaches. But frequently, you know, fan cost, wiring costs, uh, mounting and, and hanging costs, uh, all those things kind of come into play and make uh, fewer fans further apart look more attractive. You just have to choose a fan that can deliver the airspeed predictably in those scenarios. Uh, here we go with one uh, that maybe you don't want to touch, but uh, what about using uh, solar panels or aerobic digesters to be self-sufficient when we're looking at the costs of fan ventilation? Have you seen facilities where you, they've used that technology to reduce the, the electric load on fans? I haven't, but you know why? Why not? I mean, we're seeing fans generate their own natural gas. You know, there, there's lots of different ways of using cows to uh, offset uh, electrical costs. I think that's fascinating. I've given you some estimates of you know what we're talking about in the U.S. in terms of operating cost, and in most situations, you can design a mechanical system that's economically viable right now with the cost of electricity as is. But as that cost increases, we're going to have the same conversations that those in Europe are having. As their summers are getting hotter, they're really uh, you know, struggling to decide what to do where the vast majority of barns are, in, uh, are naturally ventilated and frankly, poorly designed you know, with very closed in sidewalls. They, do, they have not done the sort of open curtain sidewall thing quite as much 
uh, as we have. Uh, and uh, tremendously challenging designing a system that's economically viable when electrical costs are high. So if you can operate those systems with some other sustainable approach, then let's do it. Well, very good. Now we're in the speed round. You know what that means, Dr. Cook. Uh, uh, when, sure is your, <laughs> when is your next Dairy Land Initiative Ventilation Seminar? Do you have a date for that? Uh, we don't. We typically do them spring and fall. Uh, watch our website. Okay. Uh, what's the priority? Maybe he said I missed this. Priority of ventilating the beds versus the feeding table. Uh, if you're only going to ventilate bed, one. Bed. Cows are warming when they're lying down. They're cooling when they stand. So you do not have to supply that extra airspeed in the standing area. We just have to exhaust the air out of the barn uh, in that area. Provide the airspeed where the cows are lying down. I think you've answered this one already, but it came in. What do you think about cold mattresses uh, work better than fans? Um, in my experience, they don't work better, and they're far less reliable. Okay. Uh, should fans under the cows be directed in one direction uh, to, uh, to one side of the building to exhaust the air, or should they be lo located in two opposing directions to circulate the air? <laughs> Does that make sense uh, to you? Doesn't I'm not sure. Generally, we we move the air in the same direction of the exhaust, but not always. You know, it, it, you know, if you have a like a robot room and it's blocking air, it's perfectly acceptable to move air perpendicular to the airflow uh, in that air shadow to make sure we've got good airspeed. So you can be creative. Okay, uh, what's what, What's the better system in, in hot, humid weather, uh, the corral cooler or a tunnel ventilation system? Um, just purely from a predictable ability to exhaust air out of the system, those tunnel systems work incredibly well. Kind of a long question here. Uh, I'll, I'll read it, though, so we don't mess it up. Uh, from, around, come on. <laughs> from South Africa, from South Africa, uh, um, and they, they talk just like you do, so you'll be okay there. Uh, many dairies in South Africa, uh, heat is much like Florida, uh, use the cow manager system, which measures ear temperature. You mentioned that in your discussion. Is there a specific maximum ear temperature to use as an indication for effective cooling, or do you look for benchmarks such as lying time, rumination time, standing time, et cetera, et cetera, and et cetera? Uh, yeah, I'm more about the cow. Uh, so monitor those things, uh, see how the cows are reacting. Um, we do far more with that versus the environmental uh, temperatures. Here's one looking way down the road. Any work being done to try to capture uh, air in the in methane from the cows before, from cross the barns and tenant barns before it goes out into the environment? In other words, scrub it just like you do a coal, coal electricity. I, yeah, I believe so. I think uh, Cornell University has been looking into that. Okay, but were you... You do go to shorter answers, didn't, don't you? And the last one, I think I know the answer. Can you possibly, uh, it's possible for cows uh, like in the U.S. to survive in Africa? I guess he says, like cold places in the U.S. In other words, taking cows from Wisconsin, will they survive in Africa? Probably not. Well, <laughs> I mean, uh, if, you if you build a climate-controlled facility, uh, they will uh, they will do quite well, but uh, uh, yeah, I think there's a history of taking those black and white cows out into those kind of environments. Uh, I'm not sure it's the heat or the parasites that finishes them off. Uh, last question, and that is the shape of the baffle. Does it make it, in uh, most cases, you're doing perpendicular baffling. What about more like uh, airplanes? You, you see them change the flow of air when you take off and landing. A any thoughts of shape, changing the shape of the baffle? Yeah, I worked with uh, Chris Choi a few years ago. We modeled barns with um, different slopes. So we didn't change the baffle, but we put it at sort of 45 degree angles. And it certainly does influence the, uh, uh, the, the flow. And one of the more optimal approaches you could do is, a, is a, an angled baffle at the, the, the lead curb of that head-to-head -head stall. The problem is you know, with equipment and stuff, uh, you might hit that, and the improvements weren't so dramatic that you would uh, see a clear improvement over just simply putting a perpendicular baffle uh, over the middle of the head-to-head -head row. So we kind of plump for that. But yes, you can, you can be creative with slopes and things, and uh, certainly the baffle story isn't completely over. Well, Dr. Nigel Cook, you did an excellent job. Abby, I'll turn the program over back to you to, turn, to finish it up. Thank you, Mike. I will echo your comments. And Dr. Cook, thank you so much for this presentation and for answering this variety of questions that came in today. We really appreciate our audience for being such active listeners and for you taking the time to be with us today. 
and share this information with both our Horde Steerman readers and our monthly webinar listeners. So thank you very much. Um, if you could move the slides ahead one click. Our upcoming webinars, which are always held on the second Monday of each month, um, you can see those on the screen here. I did want to let everyone know that our archived webinars are available on our website at hordes.com, the webinars tab, and we have all of our webinars from the last 11 years archived there. So if there's a topic you'd like to check out or one of Dr. Cook's um, previous webinars, feel free to look for it there. Um, in November, we will have a presentation on the forage and feed situation, kind of what's happening right now with the harvest and what we can expect in the upcoming year for feed supplies. That'll be presented by our very own Mike Hutchins and Mike Rankin from our Hay and Forage Grower magazine. And then in December, we'll be talking about raising calves in cold weather. The presenter is Sarah Morrison from the Miner Institute. So we hope you will join us again. And then once more, I would like to thank um, Tunnel Plus for their support of our program. We really, really appreciate them helping us provide this educational opportunity to all of you. And then of course, all of you in the audience, I'd like to thank you for participating today. We really appreciate when you take some time out of your busy schedules to join us. And I hope that this information can be put to use on your farm or on the dairies that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis. So with that, I will say um, goodbye from all of us here um, on our team at Hordes Dairymen our and our team at the University of Illinois. Please take care and we hope you will join us again in the future.